The Tom Wood Show, episode 1144. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, in 2018, more people than ever are going to be starting up a side hustle online. I know how to do this, and I'll show you step by step exactly what I do in my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income. Grab it over at pathstoincome.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Today, I am sharing with you a recent appearance I made on The Scott Horton Show. And we talked about, well, what else? War and foreign policy. And then we have a little section where we talk about the constitutional question. And I know that's of interest to only some people who listen. But, you know, Scott and I are both ANCAPs, and yet we're still interested in what the Constitution says, just as a practical matter and as an interesting way of observing how the state operates, that here it is with this document, and it says it's going to do X, Y, and Z, and then it doesn't do X, Y, and Z. Well, the public needs to hear about that, <laughs> and I think it can be an eye-opening moment for them. So we go into some of the details on that. I have a whole pretty lengthy treatment of the subject of constitutional war powers over at libertyclassroom.com slash war powers that I think answers pretty much any objection your friends might raise against you. So if you have any further interest in this question, I would direct you to that page. So here we go with my appearance on The Scott Horton Show, which, by the way, you should listen to and check out. You can find Scott over at scotthorton.org, and he is also managing director at Libertarian Institute. Dot org. Here we go. All right, you guys, introducing our good friend, Thomas E. Woods. Uh, TomWoods.com is this great website. Of course, he's the author of about half the books that have ever been published, uh, including Rollback. And which is the latest, Tom? Latest is Real Dissent. Real uh, Dissent. A libertarian sets fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Yeah, exactly. See what I mean, everybody? Um, and yeah, and he does a great uh, podcast uh, interview show uh, at Tom Woods. Uh, one of the most, well, probably the most popular libertarian uh, podcast that you could find anywhere. And uh, he's good on just about everything. How are you? Welcome back. Really glad to be here, Scott. Thanks. Uh, it's good to talk to you again. Lately, it's been the other way around where you interview me on your show, but I'm glad to have you here. Well, because you have a lot more to contribute, so <laughs> that's why it's a little bit skewed. That's not that's not exactly true. What happened was I got out of that habit of interviewing you back when you were too busy to have any time to do my show at all, and then so now i got to get back Yeah, I, I went through a period where I wasn't doing anybody's show. It just didn't matter. I don't care who you are. I exactly. just I could yeah. not do it, but I'm, I'm liberated from that now. Yeah, well, and it was for good reason because you were writing all these great books and stuff. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Those days are behind me. All right. What do we want to talk about? Yeah. Well, so listen, this clip isn't nearly as good as I thought it was for my uh, memory banks in my brain here, but uh, I found this clip. It's my favorite short little soundbite from the movie JFK. Uh, it's Donald Sutherland as Mr. X, which is Fletcher Prouty, uh, talking to Jim Garrison on the park bench in Washington, D.C., Tom, and he says, The organizing principle of any society, Mr. Garrison, is for war. The authority of the state over its people resides in its war powers. And then, of course, the point being, uh, the claim being that Kennedy didn't want to escalate in Vietnam, and so that's why the army killed him. Eh, plausible enough. So anyway, but the my point being that, yeah, that really is right, huh? When I was 14, I think I was 14, may have been 15, when I first saw JFK, out of all of the junk in that movie, that's the line that really stuck out to me. That all the marble monuments and this, that, and the other thing, social security payments for grandma and roads and whatever else they dress it up in, the USA, it, first and foremost, is an army, right? Well, yeah, and I mean, it's one of these things where the progressives are kind of right when they say, isn't it funny how they hem and haw about the constraints they're under financially, and that's why we can't have, you know, school breakfasts or whatever. But man, they find that money instantaneously when there's some ridiculous pretext for launching a war, that, that no problem finding the money for that. Right. So uh, there is something to that, right? So. And secondly, as I've gotten older, I've become, I think, much, I, I think justifiably much more cynical about how I look at it. I used to think that you know, some of these people are probably sincere and they think they're making the world a better place. They're just misguided. Um, well, I think some of the 
grassroots, you know, regular person supporters of these wars probably don't know any better. They haven't read much. They just they trust certain people and they shouldn't. But the people who are actually, you know, fashioning these policies and crafting them, I just I now consider it an impossibility that they're absolute impossibility that their motives are good, that it is entirely uh, a thing about increasing power, money, influence, uh, remaking the world. It has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, their deep, profound care for people around the world. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. And yet with this Syria bombing, I was hearing from all kinds of people, look, if the U.S. doesn't do this, who's going to punish these evildoers? Like there's still – it's like none of the foreign policy – of the past 16 years or so even occurred that they're right. still acting. They're still in this la la land. Uh, I'm still picking my jaw up off the floor from Juan Cole coming out in support of the attack on Libya in 2011. And I'm going, wait, after all we've been through after, after the example set by the American empire, after a million dead in Iraq war two, you're in favor of the Pentagon doing anything to anyone under any circumstances? How could it be? And but hey, you know, history began yesterday, I guess. Yeah, so, right, right. And and let's let's sit around and pretend that any fool can't see exactly what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, that's well, and that's where we get to the other agendas and all that. So, you know what? Let's let's get back to Syria because we've got a lot to talk about about the the war powers in Syria and all this, but. You know, you talk about the the money and the budget and all that. Um, Anthony Gregory used to say that, you know, conservatives want limited government. They want government limited to the very worst things it does, imprisoning people and bombing them. Uh, but, you know, money for grandma is uh, just on the face. That's creeping socialism, you know, or whatever. Any Anything other than uh, paying merciless killers to inflict violence on people. Um, and yet... You know, I guess the idea is that it's all very necessary. You got to have uh, the minarchists say, Tom, you have to have at least enough government to prevent a worse one from replacing it, right? It needs that violent power to keep itself limited. Yeah. And then you notice that in practice, it never works. Where are all these limited governments in practice around the world? Where are they? And the United States was in a particularly enviable position, starting off with a a fresh constitution and kind of wiping the slate clean. I mean, okay, obviously they're carrying on some traditions from the past, but basically they're, they've written a constitution. They've made clear what the powers are. Everybody debated it. Everybody understood what it meant. And then already, already in 1790, Patrick Henry is saying, boy, this thing's a big failure. We've, we've got to think about revolting against this thing or, or, or you know, fighting back. Uh, clearly it's gone beyond the powers we gave it. You know, this is like 10 minutes later. <laughs> you know, so it, there is this problem that it, it seems utopian to think that you're going to keep this thing limited. As I said, Patrick Henry is already complaining in the 1790s. Amazing. That yeah. it's just coming up with – because he sees what Alexander Hamilton is up to, of course. So he, he says, oh, geez, it was a bait and switch. They said, oh, don't worry about it, everybody. It's, it's just like every single government program ever since. Don't worry about this program. It's going to be super limited, and it's only going to cost $57. Right. Now, that could be a social program, or it could be a war. It could be like the Iraq War. Don't worry about that, Scott. The, the oil revenues are going to pay for that. Yeah. You know, it happens over and over and over again, and then the opposite happens, and nobody gets fired. Nobody's punished. Nobody is shamed. I mean, who actually is a result of the Iraq War? was actually shamed. I mean, if, of all things to be shamed about, you would think that would be way up there. But yeah. no, these people are still commentators on television and nobody bats an eye. Yeah, only Peter Beinart, and it was only his own conscience. He wrote two books about how wrong he was because he was just like, oh my God, what have I done, <laughs> right? But Or Walter Jones, right? Walter but, Jones is the other example. Yeah, but, the fact that you and I can name right. the entire run of examples is not good. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a real problem. All right, so now, 1999, uh, I'm on Free Radio Austin with mostly a bunch of Earth Firsters and, and hippies and weirdos, and it was great. And uh, a lot of really good people there. And I was arguing with Copperhead was his name, and he was an anarcho-syndicalist, uh, right? Like Chomsky, anarcho-communist, really, right? So I say to him, well, but look, man, socialism with a police force 
is communism. So, you know, you say you're going to have all this collective ownership, this, that, the other thing, but without enforcement, it can't work. And with enforcement, then we're all just living under mouse. So what the hell? And he says, okay, fine. But capitalism with a police force is fascism. And I said to him, you got me. Because isn't that right? Isn't Don't we live now under what Robert Higgs calls a participatory fascism? And isn't that what Alexander Hamilton's constitution and Henry Clay's American system is all about in the first place? Was basically transferring wealth, redistributing wealth, as right-wingers say, from poor people to rich people. Cronyism. And, and, uh, and you know, war. Permanent war. Uh, and it seems to happen across the board. I, I, this is this will be the third time in a week I've used this example, but I'm going to use this example till I drop dead because it's so perfect. Even when we think about a policy, and of course all these policies have to be carried out through violence. Nobody's going to voluntarily do any of this stuff. But even a policy like tariffs, where we're taught that well, this will help people who are been, who have been ravaged by globalism, and so we want to help these these American workers. The the trouble there is. I, I like this example. In 2012, Barack Obama congratulated himself for, he said, saving 1,200 jobs by limiting the importation of Chinese tires. And he saved 1,200 tire makers' jobs. People thought, oh, well, that's pretty good. Got to hand it to him. Okay, well, how much did it cost to save those jobs? Like, it was either 1,000 or 1,200, depending on who you listen to. It cost about $1.2 billion dollars to save those jobs in terms of how much more tires wound up costing. So it ended up being like over $900,000 per job saved. So, wow, that's a lot of money to save one job, especially when the job only pays $40,000 a year. So what happened to the other $860,000? Where'd that wind up? It wound up in the pockets of the, you know, the people at the corporate level in the tire <laughs> companies. You know, they, they, they are the ones who've got the big gains, but the workers who are supposedly being protected got maybe 5% of the gains. And that is what happens in case after case of, we're just gonna help this group because they can't be honest about the people they're actually helping half the time. Now, in terms of the police in general, the thing is we have to try to think about in a free society, which of these institutions would we still have and which would we not? I mean, certainly we would not have a DEA in a free society. We would have some form of self-defense and some, some kind of a defense service, but it would be carrying out, you know, they'd be fighting against crimes of aggression. They'd be, they'd be fighting against people who, uh, you know, kill you or, or punch you in the face or whatever. Whereas at this point, you have this crazy raft of victimless crime laws and convoluted regulations that it's the job of this enforcement force to carry out. And so I wouldn't say, well, I want to privatize that because if the state is making the laws and the laws are great, many of them unjust, I don't want a more efficient force carrying them out. I want the least efficient, most bumbling force we could possibly come up with to carry those out. Yeah. Well, I mean, and this is the thing too. And I don't know why it took so long, but it was actually, it was hanging out with, uh, with friends, Adam and Jennifer on the Contra cruise last year, where it finally clicked in my brain of how to describe this discrepancy better because people use the term privatize to mean government contracting as well as just right. government getting out of an area and letting private companies take it over. And so that's what we really, I always used to joke that we need to spell one with a S instead of a Z or something like the British spelling. Is that it? And then that way one means one thing and the other means the other, but no, it's contracting. That's the point. Government yeah. contracting. And, Simple and, and to the point. That's what Adam was saying. And I went, of course, yes. That's and a that's huge, why I entirely don't, separate question from actual privatization. Yeah, and that's why I don't want to privatize the TSA, for example. Why would I want a private company carrying out the dictates of the government? In, in what way is that privatization? The, the real privatization would be let the different airlines decide what mix of security and, frankly, invasiveness they think is necessary to keep people safe. And then people can naturally sort themselves out. People who want to have a hand down their pants can go that route. And people who, 
you know, are interested in airlines whose technology is good enough that they don't need to put uh, their hand down your pants, they can go to that one, whatever. We'll, and we'll, we'll compete on cost and convenience and whatever, and we'll just see, let the best company win. But that's the farthest thing from their minds, of course. Right. Well, of course, it was government regulations that said, if anybody ever tries to hijack your plane, don't worry, they just want to fly you to Cuba. So don't resist them. You know, yeah. that's where the government yeah. regulations are the first place. That's not never yeah. going to happen again. You know, somebody tries to hijack. Well, we've seen what's happened when I guess it's only been crazy people, not actual terrorists, but a few different crazy people have tried to hijack planes in the last dozen years or so. And the passengers either, you know, beat the hell out of them or in a couple of cases, they suffocate a guy to death, just sat on his chest and, you know, no hijacking yeah. for you. Um, yeah. And, and, and TSA, of course, uh, you know, has nothing to do with protecting people in a situation like that. Never did. Um, all right. Now, so, but now here's the real deal, though. The economics of the military industrial complex. And, you know, Nick Terse wrote this book, The Complex, where, of course, it's the military industrial congressional think tank, academic, scientific, everything you know, uh, toothpaste and tube socks and shoelaces and, and army boots and every, every part of American capitalism that can get in on militarism, they do. Cause it's the biggest honeypot in the history of the world, a trillion dollars a year spent on American militarism. And you can invest, you know, I bring this one up constantly, um, where there was a story like, Oh my God, can you believe it? Lockheed Martin spent $14 million. Can you see like, uh, uh, what's his name? Mike Myers doing the pinky to the corner of his mouth, you know, $14 million in one quarter lobbying Congress. Yeah, but they take home 50 billion a year in government contracts, right? That's nothing. That's a few steak dinners, a couple of escorts and some cocaine for some uh, Republican and Democrat congressmen. And then they get to cash in. You know, they've collected a trillion and a half dollars on the F-35 that's not fast, can't climb, can't turn, isn't stealth, is worthless compared to an F-15 or an F-16. And they just continue on, just taking our money. And there's no force well-financed enough to be organized enough to stop them. It's just the dirty snowball rolling downhill. And, you know, when we talk about the genocide going on in Yemen, everybody knows that this is about weapon sales to the Saudis is like one third of the motive for doing this is just to empty bomb inventories and refill them again, Tom. We could also mention, by the way, that there's a domestic analog to this in the homeland security industry that just I wish I could remember. I was trying to find the statistic, but the number of firms that show up now at these trade shows for Homeland Security, it's thousands. It's insane where it's gone from, you know, maybe there was a dozen to now everybody wants a piece of the action. And that's the, you know, that's the domestic analog of what you're talking about. But, but yeah, all you got to do, I mean, if you look at the economics of any of this, it's ridiculous. Every 15 or 20 years, they have a blue ribbon commission to try to figure out why costs go up so dramatically in that sector. And sometimes those commissions come up with some reasonable conclusions, but the point is nobody ever does anything about it because, as you say, that's why they exist. They're there for the sake of getting inflated contracts and enriching themselves. And I know, I mean, this, I'm talking like people I would have thought were crazy years ago, but it turns out that, as in many cases, the crazy people are the ones running the show and the people who are complaining about it are the normal people. But, right. I mean, this is also true when you just look at the way they carry out a lot of these projects. They make sure that some big military project is spread out among as many congressional districts as possible, preferably in districts that have committee chairmen as congressmen, so that once it turns out that the project is a big boondoggle and everybody knows it can't work, the vested interests in the profits from it and the jobs are so spread out that good luck trying to generate any real opposition to it inside Congress. And so it just gets, it keeps going and going and going. They have this down to a science. They're not doing this by accident. They know exactly what they're doing. And then meanwhile, you've got uh, so-called conservatives who are concerned about a, you know, a $10,000 pork barrel project in Washington, D.C. or something. I mean, mm -hmm. how brain dead can you be? Right. You know, um, I'm sure you saw this, I guess, probably a year ago or something where Kelly Vallejos did this thing in the American Conservative magazine about, 
and I guess we've all heard the statistic here, there, and the other place about how whatever the number is, some huge percentage of the most wealthy counties and districts in America are all right surrounding Washington, D.C., and, and then Kelly Vlahos' article was about how they are taking bulldozers to these upper middle class neighborhoods full of very nice homes just so they can build even bigger mansions on top of these perfectly good houses, you know, whatever. And they're just, you know, it's it, this and they're just spreading McMansions mile after mile after mile in, you know, this, uh, you know, radius, uh, two thirds radius around Washington, D.C. there. And of course, the people involved in all this don't even know that it's shameful, right? Like if you go to DC, aren't you ever impressed when you go to DC and you see Lockheed, BAE systems and Raytheon on top of these gigantic uh, buildings and everything? Like they're not shy at all about their great success at at the business that they're in. And then as you say, you know, the, the Homeland Security Industrial Complex, which is almost as large as the military industrial complex now, just, you know, grown up in the last 15 years. Um, I wonder if you think there's any way to stop this other than, I guess, like Ron Paul says, wait around for the dollar to break someday. Because it sure seems like the, the economics of, of the system are almost impenetrable. Yeah, I think it's very, very difficult because it's not even the economics. It's then also they reinforce it culturally with the militarization of everything, you know, from the Super Bowl down to the airline flight you took the other day where you stood up to respect the uh, soldiers on board. It's very, very hard to crack through that when even, you know, mainstream Democrats will stand up and salute for the military because everybody knows somebody who's in the military. I, I think that's part of the reason they like having having so many people in it, because that way it makes them it makes a lot of people feel like I can't really fully full throatedly oppose the military because then I'll be opposing good old Joe over here. And I know Joe is a good guy. So it, it gives everybody kind of vested interest in perpetuating the system and they don't view it as being exploited by a bunch of sociopathic liars who are getting rich at their expense. That one sentence that I just said. If we could get that into their heads, that'd be a big help, but it really, really is a struggle. Now, one, one, if I may, in a bit self-interested manner here, point out one little bright light. I just can't resist it, but Scott, I don't remember if I ever told you this story, but about a, well, I don't know, at least about a year ago, I guess, my, at that time, 13-year-old daughter, Regina, said that a, uh, a representative from Lockheed Martin, which has a they have a big uh, facility down here in Florida, mm -hmm. was coming to their school because their teacher, who was ex-military, was bringing him in. Now, who knows why? And she said, w we're going to be allowed to ask him questions. And, of course, the kids are going to all be asking him, hey, how fast do your, you know, whatevers fly or whatever. And she wanted to ask something else. And I said, well, let's sit down and formulate a good question. And so the question we came up with and that she asked him was, do you think the American people should be concerned that there seems to be a revolving door between the military industry and government such that people from Lockheed Martin or associate, some way associated with Lockheed Martin wind up advocating military policies and buildups that appear to benefit Lockheed Martin financially. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was not the question. <laughs> the guy, you know, the guy what grade thought, is she in again? Yeah, she, she was in eighth grade at the uh -huh. time. He Perfect. wasn't prepared for that. So, you know, he gave some mealy mouth answer to try, you know, he's looking at the clock. How can I get out of here? But I, I was so proud of her at that moment that she had the guts to ask, you know, an intimidating person. Yeah, that's That awesome. kind of question. Yeah. He yeah. So, certainly I mean, was not expecting to be challenged like that. No, no, no. So, I mean, look, the truth, the thing, well, I guess it's one of these things where the internet has kind of disappointed me in that it makes so much knowledge available that you would think any sincere seeker of the truth now kind of has no excuse for not knowing the truth, and yet it hasn't led to as much of an upending of the establishment as it really should have in, in light of the information that it's spreading around. And so I have to admit I'm a bit puzzled as to what more can be done. Yeah, it's partisanship, man. It just kills everybody's brain. So stupid. It just makes everybody Oh, so yeah. Horrible. When I saw that guy, yeah. Richard, uh, now I can't think of his name, the senator from Connecticut, saying... Um, well, you know, uh, Trump should have gotten congressional approval for Syria. I thought, look, I, I haven't checked, but, you know, well, how did this guy feel under Obama? You know, I have a funny feeling he honestly couldn't have cared less. Well, and of course, the 
uh, Justin Amash uh, tweeted out this poll that showed, you know, the other side of that, which was that the Republicans absolutely opposed Obama. And and this is the the not necessarily the congressman, the congressman, too, I guess. But this is the poll was of the of conservative uh, Republican voters and that kind of thing. They absolutely opposed the exact same situation in 2013. And then by super majority support Trump if he's bombing Assad. So. You know, everybody flip flops around. But then, of course, um, you know, the libertarians, we stay good on everything all the time. And so people notice that. So uh, in the end, it's better for liberty, I guess, that uh, I, I prefer the easy way. Don't get me wrong. If people would just listen and be convinced um, by superior arguments without these yeah. crises. But people, you know, there are a lot of people who are libertarians now because Barack Obama, they thought was going to end the wars and then he didn't. And they said, wait a minute, I need to find out what's going on around here. And they be ended up becoming Ron Paulians and Tom Woodsians. And then the same thing, of course, is happening with Trump people now who go, man, we thought this guy, you know, he didn't hire any of the outright neocons at the beginning. They had all denounced him. And you know, they all hated and feared that he wasn't Israel first enough and all this. And so people put some hope in that and nah, they're disappointed too. So, you know, in the end, who's, who stays good on all this stuff? It's us. You know, Scott, let me say a somewhat random thing, but I, that is, is still relevant. Sometimes you see people argue that, uh, look, the, the president, don't worry about any of this. He can do what he wants. He can intervene where he wants. He can send troops where he wants. Uh, for 60 days because of the war powers resolution, yeah. and then Congress can demand that something be done. And and so there were people like Newt Gingrich and others who are very much against the war powers resolution because they think it constrains the president. And I just want to make sure people get this clear. The war powers resolution is a terrible atrocity, and it's not because it constrains the president. It's because for the first time, there is express statutory authorization given to the president to intervene for any reason or no reason for up to 60 days. Now, that was not understood to be one of his powers before. So the idea, well, we're just going to limit him to 60 days. Okay, but he was actually limited to zero before. So this is not a step forward. Then he has 30 days to withdraw. But the thing is, once you commit American forces somewhere, you could get them in such a quagmire that it becomes strategically difficult to withdraw them. And then the president can protest, look, if Congress is going to cut me off at the knees, they're going to undermine everything I'm doing. So this thing actually – and then instead of really just fighting the president and saying, look, it's unconstitutional. He does not have this power to do this. They wind up in these fruitless lawsuits trying to challenge him over the war powers resolution. Right. It's actually been a net minus for us. Yeah. Well – I mean, and of course, we get to the point where like today there's this article in or from yesterday at Lawfare blog that's arguing, you know, the circular argument that, well, we have troops in Syria and so they're under threat of the Syrian government. So anything that they do against the Syrian government there counts as self-defense, even though they're occupying eastern Syria against the wishes and without the invitation of the sovereign government of Syria. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in then, violation now just, of the UN Charter that the USA concocted and foisted on this planet, <laughs> yeah, we can do what crazy. we want, and you can do what we want. Yeah, and of course, these are all these are all actions that are somehow still being justified legally, either under the argument that the president can do what he wants, or that the authorization for the use of military force back in you know fifteen you know over fifteen years ago is just uh, 16, I guess now, okay. still extends to this. Now that certainly, there is no precedent for that, that mm -hmm. you would get some kind of a, a resolution that would then justify conflict after conflict after conflict in different countries under different circumstances for different reasons. I mean, that's not reasonable. Yeah. Well, okay, so I guess we'll get back to the War Powers Act in a minute. On the AUMF, let me ask you about that because there's a debate right now about you know, passing a new AUMF that would actually codify a lot of what really is ad hoc, a lot of what is actually not in the AUMF from 2001 that you talk about there, um, and particularly the term associated forces. This is something that's just basically been made up. So now AQAP in Yemen is associated forces, and the Islamic State, which used to be part of Al-Qaeda but broke off from Al-Qaeda in 2013, well, yeah, that's associated forces too. And Al-Shabaab, the local militia that George Bush uh, created with his horrible policy in Somalia. Well, I heard they took some Saudi money one time. So yeah, they're Al-Qaeda too. And 
you know, anybody's an associated force all the way down into Mali, Niger, Boko Haram in Nigeria. And, uh, and from there, you know, obviously the sky's the limit. They, they can conquer whatever they want in the name of this thing. And, um, but so I, I kind of, I'm not really sure, uh, you know, what the point is of passing this new thing when, uh, you know, legitimizing this all and codifying it as official and using that term associated forces when they've been able to get away with just twisting it this whole time or, you know, what difference it really makes either way. Yeah, I don't get what their motivations are behind it. Uh, I mean, is it that they're leaving? They're they're open now to the fact that they're really lying and that the term associated forces isn't in the AUMF, that actually Tom Daschle took a lot of the worst of Dick Cheney's language out of that thing before they passed it and that they only wish it said all the things that it says. So now they're trying to pass, although, but it's never served to limit them before. So I don't know. Right. Yeah. So it's very unclear what their motivations are. I will note just on the basis of the history that fairly early on, like by the time we get to John Adams and the quasi-war with France, uh, we already have cases where it's it's becoming established that there are two different kinds of wars. There's a declared war and a lesser undeclared war. So, for example, the quasi-war with France or the or war against the Barbary pirates. But in the case of these so-called undeclared wars, Con- congressional statutes, numerous ones, were passed each time carefully directing exactly what was to happen. And there's an interesting case under John Adams where there was a naval captain who had seized a ship coming from France, and he was sued for damages over that. Um, and so this the case wound up going to the Supreme Court, and it turns out that the that Congress had only authorized ships to be seized that were going to France. But the president said you can seize ships that are going to or from France. Well, the court found that the captain was liable because the president does not trump Congress. Uh, it, Congress didn't say you could seize ships coming from France. So the president can't just say, well, I'm the president and I'm the commander in chief. Uh, that's, that's not legitimate. C- Congress drives foreign policy. And so, therefore, this, this captain was in the wrong. Now, nobody knows cases like this, unfortunately. What they have is the neocon version of history in which uh, presidents have been doing whatever they want with basically no congressional oversight from the beginning. And then you get these crazy statements from the State Department that over a hundred times, or sometimes they'll even say hundreds of times, the president has dispatched forces without getting congressional approval. And then you look through, exa- well, what are these hundreds of times then? You know, what, what are they talking about? We're talking about like right at the time of the Korean War when people were complaining that surely you can't send like a million Americans without getting some kind of authorization, you know, into this war. And they're saying, oh, don't worry about it. There's nothing unusual about it. But it turns out these are all examples of like, you know, 10 Marines or like three army men chasing some cattle wrestlers, uh, cattle rustlers across the Mexican border. And they count that as an intervention, you know, and that that's a use of presidential war powers. You've got to be kidding me. Those are the examples they find. They come up with hundreds of those yeah. and they say that's why we can get involved in a war in Korea without consulting anybody. Well, so what about Truman's argument that he didn't need Congress because he had the U.N. Security Council had authorized the war in Korea because the Soviets were boycotting at that point and so yeah. didn't veto it. And that's well, all that's you need. Fu- the, the U.N. Participation Act of 1945 actually has a clause saying, um, and, and it's just from the beginning, that the um, participation in war of any of the member countries The decision about that will be left to their, quote, respective constitutional processes. So that is to say the U.S. would still have its constitutional mode of getting congressional approval for intervention. So the even the U.N. documents and the document by which the United States acceded to the U.N. acknowledge that we retain the right uh, to to pursue our normal congressional uh, process of declaring war even as a member of the UN. So that's just a complete BS argument. Yeah. All right. Now, so back to the uh, War Powers Act, there's actually, I mean, I guess I don't really get it. Part of it says, and and I guess I should have pulled up the language for this, uh, but part of it says that the president only has the right to repel attack and he can do that for 60 days. He doesn't have the right to start a war for 60 days, but then I guess there's another part of it a few paragraphs right. later yeah. or something. Or so explain this to me how this yeah, works. Yeah, it's I mean basically what it boils down to is that the War Powers Resolution is completely schizophrenic. 
which is another reason that it's a problem, because it means that we spend our time arguing both ways. We say, well, I've got this paragraph in support of what I'm saying, and they say, we've got this paragraph in support of what we're saying. If it really were a case of, for purely defensive means, the president can uh, call the armed forces into, uh, you know, into action, you didn't need the war powers resolution for that, because the original constitutional understanding was that the president, you notice they use the word, uh, when they talk about Congress, they use the word declare, can declare war. And that was a deliberate decision not to use the word make war, because it was thought that in an emergency, a real, real emergency, the likes of which we basically almost never experienced, the president, if he genuinely had no time to consult Congress, could make war. So that already uh, existed. But of course, they know that none of the interventions they're talking about are emergencies where the president just doesn't have the time to consult anybody. I mean, even they can't pull that one off. And so they, they fall back on this kind of language. But you're, you're right. The, the War Powers Resolution is schizophrenic, so, which is another reason it's a waste of our time. Mm-hmm. Hey, does it mean anything in Article 2 where it says, well, the president shall be the commander in chief of the armed forces when called into the actual service of the United States? Yes. I mean, what that means is even Alexander Hamilton was good about this. He says uh, in uh, Federalist 69 that the president will direct the military once hostilities have broken out and war has been declared. But thankfully, our president will be much weaker than the British king, who also had the power to declare war. So there it is. He doesn't declare the war, but he can direct the war once declared. Mm hmm. All right. So in the case of Syria here, we have basically a punitive strike based on what appears to be a hoax. Uh, I don't know if that's definitive yet, but another one of these uh, chemical weapons uh, sort of pseudo causes bellies. And they did the same thing a year ago. And it's more or less what Obama was going to do in 2013, although he backed down from it, was just hit some sites rather than a real, you know, carpet bombing campaign against Damascus or the Syrian army. So that's good at least, right? They, they haven't changed the policy uh, back to violent regime change uh, in Damascus, but he still, he did this strike. And I guess it was the New York times claiming that Mattis wanted to go to Congress, which sounds like he wanted to back down and not do it at all. Uh, he wanted to go to Congress, but Trump overruled him. So, um, but okay. So let's say that it wasn't a hoax. And let's say for argument's sake, Tom, that we know that this evil genocidal dictator is using chemical weapons to murder civilians because of how fun he thinks it is. And, and after world war two, we promise never again, we have the responsibility to protect and intervene even in a, a violent conflict that's taking place wholly within the borders of a single state. We must intervene to protect civilians from these atrocities. And if that means Donald Trump gets to fire some cruise missiles, uh, what does the law say? Well, I mean, it doesn't, the law actually doesn't matter whether it was a hoax or uh, you know, whether, what the reason is that Trump wants to intervene. Uh, the, the question about war powers is, is that the power rests with Congress and you do need to get congressional consent. As Trump himself noted, before he became president. I mean, under right. the Obama years, he was saying, hey, you got to get congressional approval before you do some stupid military thing. Now he neither wants the congressional approval, nor does he want to call it stupid any longer. But yeah, it doesn't matter. It, the question of what the war powers of the president are has nothing to do with the merits of what he's doing. It, right. it, the question is, b- because of course, he'll always claim that the merits are, are very strong. Of course, that we need to have he says well, I mean, laughingly, he's not claiming a threat we, we, to the United States, right? He's right, claming right, that this right. is a tr- an atrocity and a quote unquote civil war, although we know it's really a lot more than that. But right, I mean, on this, I would want to argue it less from the the law than from the wisdom of it, and and yeah. uh, w- well, whether we that, ought to do it. What I really but, should ask about was the international law, right? Because you know, you talked about that UN Participation Act, where the law says America's bound by that. And that says that you're not allowed to start a war unless you can get the French and the Russians and the Chinese to agree to it on the UN security council. Yeah. And then, but the, and then the security council refused to approve, I guess, uh, Russia's complaint about the strikes, even though it's probably complaining on precisely the grounds that you just did. Yeah. I mean, I'm not one to, and this is a problem, right? When the United Nations system would, hold the Americans back if they would 
obey its law, you know, um, I don't mean to invoke that as really the highest authority or anything like right. that, but it, it, it does seem meaningful though, right? When America has a gun to the head of the rest of the world all day long in the name of international law, but then eh, they can just make up and do whatever they want whenever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when they have so little credibility after time after time of you know, oh, yeah, I know we screwed up that country and now millions of people are without homes. Uh, but, you know, it's an honest mistake. <laughs> and, then, and then it happens again right. and again and again. There's no there are no at this point. I think I just think there are no honest mistakes with these people. Yeah. Well, got to get them helicopters sold. Yeah, it's just nuts. I mean, is it really so bad to make an honest living? Is that so unthinkable? I don't know. Yeah. Well, and of course you have, and this is something that's part of the free for all of the empire, right? Is you have the interests of the foreign states and so many of the think tanks in Washington, D.C. now are, I mean, so many of them already represented the Israelis, mostly with American money, I guess. But so many of these now are directly bankrolled by the governments of the UAE, Saudi and Qatar. And these are the people who are churning out all the studies about who's got to get bombed. That's yeah, a, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, of course, the studies at these think tanks generally just buttress what the regime wants to do already. Like, there's no, uh, yeah, there's but no which state regime? Department I mean, that's the thing, right? But the, but there's no there's no State Department official that says, you know, I didn't want to intervene until I read what the Heritage Foundation wrote about. Yeah. whatever you know i mean they they want to do it no, they they want to do it and this but, is just you know it's all stand. consensus building right i mean but this it's is why right we yeah see. but of course it leaves the impression that all the experts support this that's mm -hmm. the the thing is that right. it gets the general public on board because look at all these foreign policy specialists they all say we have to bomb who am i to disagree yeah well you're a decent person who who knows a sociopathic liar when he sees one i'd say that's pretty good yeah and a foreign bankrolled one at that yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. Listen, man, I love it when you come on the show. We should do this more often. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much, Tom. All right, everybody, before I let you go, I know this is a bit in the future, but couldn't hurt to save the date. The Mises Institute is having its Supporters Summit September 27th through 29th in Auburn, Alabama, where it's located. And I will be speaking there. David Stockman will be speaking there. A lot of people you've listened to on the Tom Wood Show will be speaking there. It'll be very, very much worth your while. You'll have a great time. So give it serious thought. Uh, I, I've got the um, links to my uh, upcoming appearances up at tomwoods.com slash events. Right now, it's just the Mises Supporters Summit and the Contra Cruise in October. You can find out about that at contracruise.com. We've just added Brett Vinat of the School Sucks podcast and Naomi Brockwell, who has many different things to her credit, as special guests on that cruise. So you'll want to check that out. But I have something else coming up June 30th of 2018. I'll let you know about that just as soon as I possibly can. And I would like as many people as possible to try to attend that. It won't cost anything. But anyway, the, the Mises Summit is going to be a tremendous time with a lot of fun and interesting folks. So Definitely check that all out. That's all over there at tomwoods.com slash events, which is where you can always find what I'm up to in terms of travel. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.